Hey guys, welcome to this webinar on portfolio management. So Doc and I put this on because we feel that portfolio management is one of the critical pieces a lot of investors and traders are missing as they get involved with cryptocurrency. Hopefully this webinar will give you some perspective as to how you can better manage your portfolio and use periods like a bear market to prepare for the future. So before we get started, I just wanna say thank you so much for tuning in. We love making this content for you guys. We love being the voice of reason when everybody else is telling you to buy or sell. You know, we wanna help you become a more informed and experienced cryptocurrency investor or trader so that you can use cryptocurrency to further the other objectives in your life. So without further ado, let's get started. Thanks again for watching. Good evening, everyone. My name is Doc Severson. I will be your host tonight along with Mav. I have Mav behind me here. I am excited to be bringing this, this class to your attention. Building your crypto portfolio. 10 steps to creating your investing fortress. We've had this one in the works for a long time. And this has been something that a lot of people have been asking us for. When are you going to do portfolio management? So finally, here it is in all of its glory, right? So welcome folks, I'm glad to see you out there. And for those of you that are tuning in through uh, either an archive or on YouTube or whatever have you, welcome aboard as well. Pretend that you're with us here tonight as well. Okay, before I get any further here, we do have to take care of business and say that, look, if you don't trade like a like a business, if you don't treat this seriously like a business, you will lose all your funds. You will lose all your money. This is what's going to happen. Don't do that. Treat this with the seriousness that this demands, especially with crypto. Okay. So welcome. Uh, let's see. Welcome to our premium members who are here tonight. Tonight, our goal is to share some guidance and ideas on how to construct your crypto portfolio, even as this bear rage is lower. we got about 40 minutes of material for you guys tonight, and then I will get to your questions. So we'll wrap up after an hour. We don't trend to, to drag these things out, especially for those of you in Europe that are getting a little sleepy, right? Do me a favor if you can, and this I've had to learn this the hard way through the years. Please hold your questions until the Q&A period. So we'll wrap it up as soon as we can. We'll get to your questions. I'm sure you guys wanna you know, ask some things and say what's going on, how do you answer this and that, and things like that. Hold off until the end if you can. And we'll all get out of here much sooner tonight. Okay, now I'm sorry, but I cannot comment on your portfolio. I know a lot of people say, hey, should I continue to hold Dogecoin? So either in tonight's webinar nor privately in email, we're not allowed to do it. The SEC prevents us from doing that. So tonight's topic is about building a crypto portfolio. So there's no one way to do this for everyone, right? But what we are going to show you is the basics tonight. And the basics apply to everyone. Basics apply to everyone. Well, this, uh, this handsome fellow is me. I, I don't believe in hair. I got rid of it a long time ago. I'm a husband, father of three, student pilot, former product manager, engineer. I quit my job. I'm, I'm that guy that quit his job, handed in his notice and said, I quit. I'm out of here. And uh, went to trade full time. And that was 12 years ago. It was back at the beginning of 2006. And I would say this has been a really interesting uh, 12 years. I couldn't have picked a better time to do it. So I trade options, I trade futures, I am a technical analyst, I am into crypto, neurolinguistic programming. If you've never heard of NLP before, get to know it because it's really kind of the key towards doing what it is that you want to do. And so I've been coaching this stuff since 2005, pretty much at gunpoint. I had people coming to my door when they found out that I knew about this stuff and said, can you please show me how to do this? I can't get an answer from anybody else. So you know, here I am, <laughs> right? And I actually love doing this. I love helping people through this. I don't know if you can tell coming through the microphone, but this is what I do. So I like to be an innovator. There's a lot of people that are out there that are just in this for a buck. 
And I don't like to do this. I like to share things. I like that joy that comes through when people finally get something and, and get to see a change in their life. So I have been trading for 21 years, and my gosh, I have made every possible mistake that you could ever imagine. And that's how you learn, guys. That's how you learn. That's how you get better at what you do, is you have to make the mistakes because we're all human. And because of the fact that we're human, we have all those programmed DNA mistakes in us, which makes us terrible traders. And we have to unlearn how to be human to trade effectively. We'll get into some of that tonight. I've also written a book. This came out a couple years ago. It's called Hacking the Holy Grail. doesn't matter what market that you're in. If you're out there looking for the Holy Grail, if you're out there looking for the perfect trade that doesn't exist, it's actually between your ears. So that's out there on Amazon if you're curious. All right. With that underway, what is the problem that we're trying to solve here tonight? We're trying to solve a problem. That's why we're getting together. Everybody's got a problem right now. We want to solve that, move on, and, and move forward in life. The issue has been that Bitcoin and crypto has been in a bear market since early 2018. Yeah, it's a little bit of a problem, depending on your point of view, right? Since this point in early 2018, bear market, big time, right? Yet, the majority of crypto investors bought up here. The majority of crypto investors bought up here. They, they went in for the FOMO move. The FOMO means fear of missing out. My God, it might leave without me. Chasing it down the station, right? On the railroad tracks, chasing after this train. And this is where a lot of people got in. Okay, so the question that we've received since day one has been, hey, Doc, when should I sell? What should my stop loss be? Well, <clears throat> there's a problem I have with that question. If you're asking that question, especially at this time, you're too late to act on it. Too late to act on it. It's too late. So let's spend a minute retracing our steps. Let's see how we got here. How come so many crypto investors ended up in this dark hole, right? So first off, you bought into an asset class that most of you had only just heard about last year. For many people, this is the first time that they really got any experience with it. Secondly, most of your investing direction has been picked up from Reddit and Twitter, learning the ropes while watching other people troll themselves, right? It's, it's entertaining, it's fun, but you pick up some really bad advice. And then you learn to spell HODL, which was used as a rallying cry Basically, by other people telling you what to do with your capital. Very nice of them, right? Oh, please, I'm begging you guys, hodl, right? So in the end, you're left holding your bags. We buy when the decision feels good to make, and we hold on to losing trades far too long based on our hope that it will recover. So we're out there operating without a compass, and that's no way to navigate this market so look guys what's done is done we're not going to pound on that anymore no point in beating yourself up for what has already happened what's done is done so the only thing that you can do at this point is you can change the future based on a vector that you can set today you know what do they say like a one degree difference in direction well you know after so many miles it's going to be you know so many other miles Right, it, it can make a huge difference just on a one degree vector that you set today. Oh, I like that. Bald men unite. Excellent. All right, so from this day forward, <clears throat> let's take a more professional approach to building and managing a portfolio, shall we? And not just run around and spout cute little expressions. This market is merciless. We need to match that level of seriousness if we want to be successful here. So Mav and I have created the following material, 10 steps to building your investing fortress, which can give you some concrete guidance for your actions moving forward. You guys ready? Here we go. Question number one, are you a trader or are you an investor? So for most people, those two terms are interchangeable. Well, as a trader is an investor and an investor is a trader. Uh, wrong, that is not true. So many people that bought up here 
thought of themselves as long-term investors. I'm a hodler. Yes, I am. I'm going to hodl through the worst of times. I've drunk the Kool-Aid, and I'm going to hold on to this thing forever and ever and ever and ever. And then what happens is you wake up one day and the price is down here and you're like, well, I don't know about that. All of a sudden you start to squirm and you're like, well, maybe this hodling stuff is not really what I want to do. Maybe I should sell out of this before it goes to zero. Right? Admit it. You guys have all thought about this before. Look, if you're truly an investor, your time horizon is several years out. Right? So I've got people in the chat room saying, I'm a trader. You view bear markets like today's as an opportunity, not a hindrance. Seriously, if you're an investor, if you're truly an investor, if you have that type of mindset, and man, it takes a real Zen mindset to be an investor in this market. You're looking at this and going, ah, this is great. The price keeps dropping. I love this. That's what an investor thinks. A true investor is in this for the duration and looks at big dips in price as a gift to get a lower cost basis. Right? So dips like this, this is great. But, guys, that is not everyone's game. And I do want to remind you guys that please don't ask questions until we get to the Q&A period because I really can't respond to them yet. Otherwise, we will drag everything down and make it longer for everybody, right? So this is not everybody's game. This is not everybody's game. Some don't have five years to quietly work at this. I had some guy reach out to me the other day and said, hey, I'm 82. I'm sorry, but I don't have five years for this to work out. I need something now. They have shorter time horizon and they need faster results. If you have a shorter time horizon, then you might be a trader, not an investor. Full disclosure, I am not an investor. I could do it if I wanted to. I just lack the patience. I like short-term opportunities. So a trader buys assets only when they're going higher. Why buy assets when they're going lower? Why not just buy them when they're going higher, right? That's what a trader does. Traders do not generally, and I say this generally, some do by mistake, Traders do not generally hold on to assets that fall in price for any length of time, unless they are short. Short means that you've got a bearish position that gains value as the price goes down. They have very clear rules about entries and exits and are generally in cash or into stable coins most of the time. That's what a trader does. They're snipers. They're sitting up in the tree. They're looking for opportunities, patiently waiting, 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 waiting for the right moment to pull the trigger. So much of what follows today depends on whether you're a trader or an investor. So that is step one of your homework for tonight. Figure out whether you're a trader or an investor. And now I'm going to get to number two. And MAV is coming up soon. Don't worry, guys. MAV will be right up in a minute here. Number two, cost averaging and technical trading. So these are kind of related to point number one. This is referred to as DCA, which is an acronym for dollar cost averaging, but can be applied to any fiat or base currency. So I, I could also say ruble cost averaging, right? Or I could say... Euro cost averaging, whatever fiat currency you want to use in here, I don't want to be exclusive to the US or Canada or Australia. So the idea behind this is to average down in price when you buy something. All right, it makes sense. You guys all sort of know this. So there's two main ways to do this depending on your skill set. Two main ways to do this. You can do this on a timed basis where you buy a fixed fiat amount on a regular schedule, regardless of the current price. You just keep doing it like clockwork and you don't care what the price is. And in fact, you hope that the price goes down because then that allows you to buy more of the same asset for the same amount of fiat that you put in. Okay, so that is timed 
dollar cost averaging. You can also do this on a technical basis where you buy a fixed fiat amount when a specific technical signal appears. But you've got to define that ahead of time. In this case, we're going to look for this particular oscillator to go below a certain level. And then at such point, we shall, thou shalt buy when you see that signal hit that oversold level. Right? So there's two ways to do this. One is more technical. One is just timed. There's no, the timed one is, is more for the true fundamental investor, the random walk kind of person that thinks charts belong on the sunken ships at the bottom of the ocean. So each method has positives and negatives to them. So again, cost averaging is only for a longer term horizon investor that does not care about the short-term price fluctuations. Quite honestly, just about everybody that I meet really does care about short-term price fluctuations, right? It's, it's actually quite a rare bird that when you truly meet somebody that doesn't care about that. So a trader, however, has a much shorter time horizon and they cannot endure years of being underwater. They must seek positions that will pay off immediately. So a trader buys assets only when they're going higher, like I said before, right? So think about that. Now, what they can also do is traders typically will also have a, a fairly augmented skill set when it comes to charts. And so what they can do is they can go down in time frame and identify high probability reversal signals where they can look for that breakout and jump in there, get in, get their fair share, get out, go back to fiat or stable where they belong. So be one or the other. Be a trader or be an investor. Don't change course in the middle of the investment, right? There's so many people that I ran into that bought Bitcoin when it was up here and said, I am a hodler. I'm an investor. I'm in this for the long haul. Whoa, what happened down here? Maybe I should sell out. Well, no, <laughs> you can't change. You can't change your stripes in the middle of the investment. That's not how this works. You can't do it that way. You have to commit at the beginning. So it is possible to treat different chunks of capital in different manners. So what I mean by this is maybe you could take your entire account Right, so we could take your entire account, let's play Mr. Pie Graph here, and you can say maybe this part of it I'm going to be a trader. And maybe this part of it I'm going to be an investor. So this is going to be more investment, this is going to be more short term trading over here. Okay, so it's possible to do that, but it generally does require a larger account to have the luxury to be able to split up your your capital in a manner like this to be able to diversify or or you know bifurcate this capital like that. So I've also found that trading versus investing follows personality traits. So don't try to be someone or some thing that you're not. And actually this is um, you guys might even recognize this by you know just our interaction here is that very much I am the trader of the two and Mav is much more of the the patient investor. It's it's funny that a guy that's half my age has got much more patience than I do. That's the way that's the way we're wired. Here's number three portfolio risk management. The number one thing that destroys this is one of my you know I'm banging on the table about this stuff every day because I see this happen regardless of the market. I see it regardless of who is doing what or everything. Everybody goes through this phase. The number one thing that destroys retail accounts is trading positions that are too large for that account. Nobody sits down and tells you when you're in school, say, hey, when you do get to investing, make sure you don't trade a position that's too large for your account. So we all have to learn this the hard way to begin with because nobody, this is not common street knowledge. It's not something that's spray painted on a wall somewhere that you can learn, right? This is something that you almost have to screw up first to learn about later on. Now, the number two thing that destroys accounts is not defining your exits before placing the trade. 
remember my hodler friend that was up here buying Bitcoin over here and he's like, wee, this is fun. And all of a sudden, whoa, where's my exit? I don't know. And that's where they come to me and they say, what should my exit be? And I'm like, don't ask me. You have to define your exits before you enter the trade. That's the secret. It sounds so simple to say. It is so difficult to do for the newer retail trader. That's what you got to do, guys. So the easiest way to put a bullseye on your account is to trade a position that represents far too much risk for your portfolio. Happens every time. So the golden rule of risk management is to limit risk on any one position to 2% of your account. No more than 2% of your account at risk per position. Per position, that's the key. So in this manner, no one position will take you out if it goes against you. Now, I can hear you guys out there. I can hear it. 2%? Whoa, my God, that's way too small. That is way too small. Look, I'm not saying you can only trade 2% of your account, period. I'm saying per position, because what I don't want you to do is these huge monolithic positions that generate too much real estate in your account. Use small positions to build your position up. So in other words, if you're going to build a larger position, let's say you've fallen in love with Ethereum and you want to be a long-term holder of Ethereum, then this represents your total Ethereum position. You're going to build this up a little bit at a time, brick by brick, right? Brick by brick. Enter when the edge is in your favor. Or if you're going to do that dollar cost averaging thing or enter on dips or things like that, just build it up dip by dip like that. Don't enter the entire position all at once. That is almost a guaranteed way to blow up your account. So rule number one is to define exits before you enter. The golden rule is to create larger positions using multiple smaller ones. Don't put everything in one place. What do they say? Chinese proverb says a fox has many dens, right? So I, the, here's the moment you've all been waiting for. We're now gonna bring on Mav. So he's gonna come right up here. Hey everyone, how we doing? So I'm gonna try to roll through this as quick as I can, uh, but if I'm going too fast, please let me know in the chat that I need to slow down or anything like that. Just wanna make sure that we get through this in the hour block that you've so generously given us, uh, especially for our friends in Europe. Uh, I, I really appreciate you being on at this time. So to that end, let's get started. So the fourth thing to know about building a portfolio is risk allocation. And so that's a little bit different than risk management because risk allocation is now that you've sort of identified how you manage risk, now you need to build a portfolio based on risk allocation. So what that means is that we're going to split up our portfolio. I use this system called uh, tier one through four where I'm building a portfolio based on my risk and I'm evaluating, you know, is this coin a tier one, a tier four, and I'll explain kind of what that means. So tier one coins are coins which have considerable assets invested, and I'm a firm believer in the project direction and ex execution, and they have a very little reason to sell within the short to midterm. And these are coins which we've risk evaluated to be very solid and have a high probability of existence duration, meaning they're not going to exit scam anytime soon. You know, these are the coins that we trust the most, that we've done the most research in, we believe the most in, these are sort of our core positions. Moving along, we have tier two coins, and these are coins that have performed extremely well. We have large amounts of assets with, and we believe we'll continue to operate with high marks. What separates these coins from our tier one status is a flaw, or they haven't yet proven their defining feature, though maybe they will in the future. Tier three coins are those coins which have moderate investments, and we believe the possibility of high performance in the future but as of yet, they've not shown enough performance to reduce their risk profile. Tier three coins are coins which are moderately risky, but due to our risk analysis of the project or team, we believe they have a minimal chance of failure. And finally, we have tier four coins. And these are coins that we've got a minimal stake in because we find them to be highly risky. These are coins that represent the outer fridge of our risk analysis. 
that we have little information to work with, have little insight into the coin's performance, and at the very best, we're making an educated guess as whether or not they'll be successful. If a coin performs well and proves it has commitment to its compelling feature, it'll be moved into a tier three status. And so that's sort of the takeaway here is that coins always start at tier four. We always go from the bottom up. We never start from the top down. We always build our portfolio from the bottom up because we want to have coins move naturally from the bottom up, you know, that most risky status to the least risky status. We want to, as we learn more about the project, as we expand our holdings in them, we want those coins to sort of be battle tested. It's almost like a gladiatorial match where over time, only a few coins will make it from tier four to three and even less coins will make it to three to two. And finally, tier one is our most coveted. You know, this is only gonna be one or two, maybe three or four coins that you've really taken the time to research and invest in. So the question is, how do you determine what's a tier one versus a tier four? And when should you get into something that might classify as a tier one? So with that, we get this question a lot and it really comes down to your individual goals. For example, are you looking to get into something more, I don't know, stable? Or are you looking to do a little bit more risky type of investing? Are you more of a trader or an investor as Doc said? Do you wanna try and DCA a downward trend or are you more of a technical trader just looking for the best entry you can? Just like everything in life, there are options and ultimately decision is yours. What we try to impress is that while you could absolutely copy our portfolio or someone else's, it's much better for you to take ownership of your own. For example, many of our tier one and two coins are supply chain and platform coins because these are sectors we've identified as being low risk and the coins we feel are some of the best in their respective categories. But maybe you think that privacy and payment coins are better. Or maybe you think lending and real estate is the be best blockchain use case. Do you see where I'm going with this? The space is very immature and we don't have the funds and managed portfolios like traditional markets. You get, ahead, you get ahead in this space by finding your own groove and looking for the opportunities. Speculation is the name of the game right now. It's a little scary, but the reward is definitely worth the risk. So hopefully what I'm, make, what I'm saying is making sense. You want to start small. You want to find a few coins that you really believe in and have done a lot of research for. Let's say start with five and build a portfolio out of them. Then slowly make additions or removals as you discover and learn more. Curate, adapt, and never settle. As for how to start, you need to find coins which are the core of your circle of competence. So perhaps... People sometimes ask why I don't have more tier one coins or isn't blank coin a tier one coin? Perhaps to you it is, but not to me. And that's the key. My portfolio is not your portfolio. What I choose to be a tier one coin is strictly up to my credentials, my research and my investment level. I classify tier one coins that way, not only because of how much money I've invested, but also how much time I've taken to understand them read about them and begin to trust their mission. These are the coins, the investments at the heart of my circle of competence. Take some time to learn about it. It's a classic Warren Buffett technique. Coins always start out as tier four, sort of the outside of the circle of competence, but they move up as I trust them more and my position with them grows, but they can easily move down or outwards if they lose that trust. I invest more in what I know rather than knowing what I should invest more in. And this has made the world of difference for me. Cryptocurrency can be gambling or it can be investing. And the difference is how you treat it. A big piece of this is a classic acronym you might see all over the place if you hang out in crypto communities, D-Y-O-R, or do your own research. But what does that really mean? Well, it's basically something related to fundamental analysis in the sense that you need to research the project you need to do your own research because only you can determine what you want to invest in. No one else should be investing your money. You're the one who's the ultimate arbitrator of how it gets invested. So to that end, you need to understand what you're getting into. So let's briefly go through how I do fundamental analysis, some of the things I look for when I'm looking at a project, because this is 
critical to how to build a portfolio is you need to know what you're investing in. You need to know what's going into your portfolio. So first visit the website of a coin you're interested, read everything on the front page. What are they doing? What is their vision? What market are they in? What's their roadmap? Do they already have a product or a prototype or an MVP? Take a look at the white paper. It's really critical. What is your impression? Is it salesy? Is it very technical? Do you understand it? What is, <laughs> what's the necessary part of this project? Why is this project necessary? What problem are they solving? Why do they need to own a token for this? Make sure you understand what the project is doing. Write down what you think it does in one to two sentences in your research document. Next, look at the market. What market are they in? How big is that market? And what's the growth potential? Who will be the people using this token or project or whatever? Who are the other players in the field, their competitors? Find them and take a look at them. What are the advantages or disadvantages versus those competitors? And how established are the competitors? What are their business models? Next, look at the project history. When did the project start? What have been the previous milestones and events? Did they do an ICO? If yes, what were the terms? The token distribution? Do you think it was fair? For example, if the, if the team kept 90% of the issued tokens, then that's not a very fair distribution. Now, definitely look at the team behind the project. Is the team clearly presented on the homepage? If they have a good team, they'll want to show it off. If it's not on their website or they're hiding the names of the team members, that's not a good sign. What will be a really good sign is if you can see their Twitter or LinkedIn profiles. Does, this seem, the, does the team seem capable and committed enough to pull off the project objective? Next, look at the community. What channels are they present on? Visit their subreddit and take a look at the subscriber count and the post activity. Do they have an active blog or a Twitter? Look at their social presence and blogging history. Next, look at their development history and activity. Take a look at their GitHub. The project will often have a link to it somewhere on the homepage. If not, that's because they don't have public code yet. And that's probably a point of contention, but sometimes there's good reasons for hiding the code. If they do have a public GitHub, you should see a team overview with all the repositories sort of sorted by the latest activity. When have the repositories been last updated? Is the development active? Is it consonant over a long period of time? You don't want to see short breaks or long absences of activity. You want to see constant flow of developer activity because that shows constant, you know, activity commitment by the team. On any GitHub repo, you can click insights and graphs to get a visual, visual representation of the development activity. So basically to sum up this whole part, personally, I only invest in coins with solid and usable technology, a clear future use case, a transparent and researchable team, evidence of active GitHub or code or working product. And finally, a token that has value within the project. And this is really critical. You got to see that. And inherently it's part of some ecosystem. So next I've talked a lot about sort of the, the way that projects will break down and what their competitors are. But I think this is a really important piece and it's called sector allocation. So, Understanding how your crypto project, your chosen crypto project, breaks down into the world of crypto, it's very diverse, gives you a better understanding of not only what you're investing in, but sort of what is the map of the space? What is the different possibilities, the good use cases? For example, you might think that identity or advertising is a really good use case for crypto. So you might want to go after projects in that sort of sector. In this way, you can start to group together similar projects. You could say, I want to invest in the entire identity sector. I want to invest in every project I can find in that sector because I think that's a really good sector. I think it's really going to take off in the future. Or you might say, hey, I really like decentralized exchanges. I think they're uh, the future. They're way better than centralized exchanges. So I'm going to invest in everyone I can find, or I really like a couple of them. And so you sort of want to just hedge your bets within sort of the, the sector that you choose. Investing in one project, going all in on one thing alone, is just not a really good strategy because it leaves you open to sort of what if the project gets shut down or it gets labeled as a security or the CEO gets found to be you know fraudulent or something like that. You don't know the future. And honestly, crypto is one of the most speculative and high risk 
spaces out there. So you want to do everything you can to limit that risk. And one of the best ways you can do that is by sector allocation, by investing in entire sectors instead of just individual cryptos. So take some time to understand what different sectors there are out there. This is only a list, I think, of about 24, but I'm working on a series of videos right now that's covering 45 or more sectors that are out there. And I'm sure if I really wanted to get granular, I could go over 100. But the point is, there's so many different use cases out here. There's so many different sectors. There's so many good projects that are in certain sectors that you just need to take some time to understand what's this space like. Stop letting other people tell you what to invest in and start taking ownership of what you want to find, what you want to interest be, be interested by, you know, what you want to invest in. And I think that will help you become a more informed investor. You'll know what you're investing in. You'll have pride to say, hey, I, I read the white paper for that project. I know exactly what's going on with it. I've got this opinion about it. And people will really respect you for that. They'll really know that you are a competent investor. You know what you're doing. You know this space well enough to say, hey, I know the difference between this project and that project. And this is the pros and cons of this project versus this one. And you really become a, a voice in the space. You become a more capable and informed investor. And I think that's what this space needs more than anything, really, at this point. I think we've sort of transitioned from that, that Lambo psychology to something a little bit more transient. We're getting to a point in time where legitimacy and recognition is the most important thing. We're getting to a point where as institutional investors start to look at the space, you need to be focusing on more and more, less of the, the you know, ICO, t small coins outside of the top 1000, that sort of thing, and sort of more into the coins that are more legitimate, that have legitimate use cases that are gonna be around for a while. So take the time to understand that. And as I used before, look at that risk allocation to say, okay, how can I invest in more legitimate projects so they make up more of my portfolio, that I have those core positions, that I have those tier ones and tier twos, so that you, as, as the space changes, as the space evolves, you're less susceptible to all the changes that are gonna come about. You know, the SEC coming down on lots of ICOs for securities laws and that sort of thing you'll be prepared because you've taken the time to research and prepare. So moving along, we'll get into crypto security. And so this is another piece of portfolio management that might go, I don't know, unappreciated, but I think is critical if you really want to be in the space for a long term, because so many, so many times I've seen people get taken advantage of, or, you know, just today with the BitThumb hack, you know that you have to take ownership of your crypto. You have, you have to take ownership of your investments. And if you don't, you leave yourself susceptible to these hacks, these this malware being taken advantage of by other people who want to take advantage of your ignorance and you know <laughs> that you don't know any better. And they'll, they'll definitely do it. Every day, new malware is being written. Every day, new scams and hacks are being hatched. You need to stay on top of this. You need to make security a priority. And so I often say that security is a spectrum. It goes between convenience and absolute security. You know, for some people, it might not be the best, most prevalent thing to do, you know, to add all these, these locks on their doors, basically. Um, if they're a trader, for example, you know, if you're just going to be on Binance trading Bitcoin or a bunch of other altcoins, you don't need layers and layers of security you don't need a hardware wallet if you're just going to be existing on an exchange you're just doing that sort of thing you you're more con you know you want convenience more than security there's still steps you can take to better secure your binance account but for the most part you're you just want to be careful with what you do on binance and you want to be making sure that you take the necessary precautions you want to set up two-factor authentication that sort of thing but generally you'll be less concerned with that sort of stuff because you're mo you're using small positions you're you're trading in short terms whereas if you're a long-term investor you need to make security more of a priority you need to look at your portfolio and say okay how can i diversify in this in certain ways how can i lock certain funds up long term how can i protect them you know 
you do want to use something like a hardware wallet. You do want to maybe look at some sort of offline cold wallet, you know, maybe even something like a multi-sig wallet where you've got multiple keys, you know, that sort of thing. You need to make security a priority. You need to look at your computer and say, how is this possibly susceptible to malware and anything else that could possibly infect it? And look for possible vulnerabilities so that you are protecting yourself now so you're not waking up someday in the future saying, oh man, where, where's all my crypto? What happened? You know, you don't want to be that person. You don't want to be the one who wakes up to a headline saying, hey, this exchange got hacked. You lost all your crypto. Sorry. <laughs> you don't want to be in that position. Trust me. It is terrible to be in. You want to take ownership because if you get your crypto off an exchange and move it into your own wallet, then you become the bank. Essentially, if you control the private key, you control the crypto. If you are storing your cryptocurrency on an exchange, you're letting them do that for you. And that's why I often say, if you're not doing short-term stuff, you need to get your crypto off exchanges because it's the least secure place to, to store it. It's just not a good idea. So I, I don't wanna to go too far onto security. It's a big topic. We've got a whole other class that covers it, but basically make it a priority. It's a mindset. It's, it's something you need to think about every day. You need to stay one step ahead of the people who are trying to take advantage of you so you don't get taken advantage of, you don't lose your crypto because you don't wanna be you don't want to be the person who says, oh, I lost some Bitcoin. I, you know, this space isn't for me. I'm out of here. You don't want to be that person. You don't want to lose this opportunity simply because you didn't make security a priority. So moving on, the last point I want to talk about is our 10 rules of crypto. And so this is pretty self-explanatory, but I'll, I'll still go through a couple of these. So for example, don't invest in what you can't afford to lose. That gets repeated over and over again in the crypto space. And for a good reason, it harkens to what Doc was talking about earlier. It's risk management. It's making sure that you're not getting in with the, you know, expectation of, oh, I'm gonna get a Lamborghini. You know, I, I'm gonna throw everything I can in there and hope for the best. And then finding out that you can't afford rent or groceries. Don't be that person. Do this only with money you can afford to lose. Play with profits. Trust me, it will give you such a better sense of security and <laughs> reduce the stress if you're definitely six months into a bear market and you, hopefully this is a good lesson for you in the future in terms of how to invest how to make sure that you're not waking up six months in the future saying oh man i i, I invested way too much and that's where we get into other things like understanding fomo and don't chase pumps you need to understand how you operate as an investor or a trader, how you operate when presented with an opportunity, and make sure that you understand that FOMO is very real. It's the fear of missing out. And you know when you see a, a position going skyward, it's, it's really tempting to jump in, but you don't want to be that person who jumps in and immediately it dumps afterwards. Everybody's been there, but you know it's, you got to stay away from that kind of stuff. You want to make good opportunities you you want to take advantage of them when you can but you want to make your own opportunities too so that's where you know point number eight take your time do your research you want to make sure you're doing it over the long term and just have fun with it make sure you're doing this for the right reasons don't make crypto your get rich or nothing kind of strategy it should be something that is part of your life but it shouldn't be the only thing that matters because then you'll be up at 4 a.m. looking at your block folio and you won't be able to sleep and people will be asking what's going on, that sort of thing. Trust me, just take it day by day, you know, do, do your best to build a solid portfolio by minimizing risk and you'll be much happier for it. You will wake up a year from now and say, I'm so glad I took the, the time to, and, you know, thought through these things and really just looked at it from a different perspective. And I, I built this portfolio I'm really proud of and it's done really well, you know, that sort of thing. Make it something that you're proud of so that you have ownership of it because it shouldn't be anyone else telling you what you should do with your money. <laughs> Certainly not us or anyone on Reddit or Twitter or whatever. It's your money. So make sure you're putting it in, you know, building it out how you want to. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Doc to finish this out. All right, uh, <clears throat> we've got two more points, and I'm going to wrap things up for you guys tonight. So I hope you're doing okay. 
Got something to drink? I do. So number nine is running your portfolio like a business. There is a mistaken impression that an investor is some kind of gunslinger. It, not that way. Nothing could be further from the truth, right? So if you're doing it right, whether trading or investing, it should be almost boring. I know that sounds odd to say. Most people think that a trader is the, the guy sitting up back in a, you know, sitting in a, in a lounge with their laptop. That's not the case. Actually, traders work very hard to do this. Retail investors also try to manage their crypto portfolio on the fly. This does not work, guys. So why not try something different starting now? Why not try putting together an actual business plan for your investments? Your competition's doing it. I'm doing it. Don't let us get an edge over you guys. And that leads to number 10, continuous improvement. Once you do get the plan, this is what many people do. They draft a plan and then they set it up on the shelf. It becomes shelfware. You pat yourself on the back. You say, yep, I put a plan together. I'm awesome. And there it sits up on the shelf. It doesn't do any good up there. A professional investor will draft a plan and will refer to it at least once a month to check their progress versus the plan. If they're not performing the plan, then find the culprit and change something, right? There's a reason why cars have a steering wheel, so you can make corrections and adjustments. This is what we need to do with our plan. We're going to start with our goals. We're going to understand what our goals are for our trading, right? We're going to set them up through rules, whether or not you're a trader or an investor. You're going to get some kind of results. You're going to find some kind of results from at least some initial trades. Maybe they are going to meet your goals, maybe not. Chances are there's something that you can improve. And perhaps we're in an even modifier goals as well, too. Right? This cycle never stops, guys. The same goes for your investing business. <clears throat> So it's not whether you get it perfectly right the first time, you will not. It's who shows up every day and relentlessly improves who's going to win investing in the crypto space. Okay, let's do a quick recap and then we'll get to your questions. So we looked at why retail traders tend to build fragile portfolios. So we looked at understanding trading versus investing. We looked at cost averaging and technical entries. We discussed the two major rules of risk management, didn't we? Rule number one and the golden rule. We looked at uh, crypto risk allocations. We covered the 10 steps of crypto fundamental analysis. We looked at how a portfolio should be structured by sector. We discussed the 10 rules of crypto security. We covered the 10 rules of crypto, right? So we discussed why you need to operate from a business plan and how to keep it continuously improving your results. So I hope this has been a valuable session tonight that you're inspired to retool your trading plan. If you have never heard of these suggestions or techniques before, they will make an immediate impact to your skill set and hopefully your profits as well. Don't worry, you guys will get a recording of tonight's session so if you're sitting there frantically trying to take notes, don't worry, you'll get a recording of this and a replay. So for those of you that want to take your crypto trading to the next level, I do have a little bit more, though. The Ready, Set, Crypto, Building Your Crypto Portfolio Online Class. So this is what the class entails. We're going to start out with an overview and say, okay, this is our, this is our challenge. This is what it's going to take to build a crypto portfolio. We're going to be talking about asset classes, risk versus reward. <clears throat> Remember, MAV went into the tiers one, two, three, and four. We're going to talk about the different sectors, what they mean. We're going to talk about structuring your portfolio to meet your needs and your risk reward. We're going to talk about, again, the trader versus investor question, and then go into the various forms of DCA, as well as technical entries if you are a trader. We'll touch upon security for your crypto portfolio. We will also show tools that you can use to manage and monitor your portfolio. And then we will get into the business plans and how to create that business plan and create that constant, continuous improvement. 
So this class, the instructor is actually, this one's going to be a little different. We're going to split this one up between Mav and myself. It is going to have over three hours of video content in the members area. So it, it is normally a one-time $99 charge. It is on sale tonight for 90, 79 bucks. Or for those of you that are premium members using our $10 off coupon, $69, $69. The discount disappears like magic this weekend. So please act on it now. Don't pay retail. This is where you go, readysetcrypto.com slash port, P-O-R-T. It is not available to the public. If you go out to the store, you will not find this class tonight. You've got to go to this page, readysetcrypto.com slash port, and you can save 20 bucks right off the bat, plus another $10 if you have that coupon. If you are a valued premium member, you get that $10 off coupon. So add it to the cart, get going with that tonight. Okay, we also have a value bundle for those that want a discount on the intro to fundamental analysis class. So this is a phenomenal class that Mav put together. So what this bundle includes is building your crypto portfolio class, okay, and the intro to fundamental analysis, so list 59. So if you put those two together, that'd be 158 bucks, but you can get the value bundle for 128 and save 30 bucks tonight. So premium members get an additional $10 off of that with the coupon. It pays to be a member. But we didn't want to stop there. So this is uh, readysetcrypto.com port fun slash port fun. So again, not available to the public, only via this link. And I will re remind you guys what these links are in a minute. Buck 28 minus 10 if you have a coupon. If you want more, we have more. We have the Mega Bundle available for you tonight. Mega Bundle. Building your crypto portfolio class, intro to fundamental analysis, and the intro to technical analysis class, which um, I think this is our actually our highest selling class, Mav, so if you want to arm wrestle over that one. <laughs> So the list price for the Mega Bundle would be $217, but you can get this tonight for $177. Save $40, or you can even save $50 if you're a premium member. Okay? So that one is available at readysetcrypto.com slash mega. Not available to the public. You will not see this on the store. This is the only link that you can get to this Mega Bundle, you will be busy all weekend reading this material and watching these videos. Okay, so here's the net for it. Here's the three links. ReadySetCrypto.com slash port for just the portfolio class. If you want the first bundle, it is Port Fun, which is the fundamental and portfolio bundle. And then the Mega Bundle is slash mega. ReadySetCrypto.com slash mega. There we go, guys. Don't let the discounts pass you by. Do not pay retail for these classes. I mean, seriously, we've been talking about dollar cost averaging, so why would you do the same, right? So with that, I would be happy to take your questions. I thank you for your attention to this point. We will uh, get to your questions right now.